At this time, I'd like to introduce our two panelists, Joni Lamasha and John Andrew, both from Northeastern University. Joni, thank Andrew, how are you doing? Great, thank Great. you, Ryan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction and um, welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today. We're, we're excited to present our um, recently published text, Look Up, uh, a, a, a book on experiential learning. And um, so we thought we'd just start by introducing ourselves, talking a little bit, introducing a little bit of, of who we are and how we came to write this book. Um, we work, we both are cooperative education faculty at Northeastern University. And by that, meaning that we work with students here teaching uh, the Intro to Cooperative Education course that prepares students for uh, a four to six month placement in their field of study. And here at Northeastern, we alternate uh, academic learning with experiential learning in the field for students. And so we teach the course, we advise students on their experiential learning and cooperative ed placements. And we also work with employers to develop these opportunities for students. Um, and so we came to write this book based on this experience, having been at Northeastern for, for 10 years, uh, 20 years collectively, and our work in cooperative education and really wanting to bring together key concepts that we have kind of introduced over the years in our course and working with students uh, based on experiential learning theory, uh, bringing in teaching tools and resources for students, transitioning from classroom to workplace and then back to the classroom, uh, bringing in key employer perspectives and anecdotes as well as student insights and, and stories from their, their cooperative education placements and experiential learning in general. So we basically wanted to, to kind of create a text that was interactive and that could be used both in the classroom or in experiential learning programs, as well as uh, students using the text independently. So we're excited to share this with you today provide an overview of the book and the chapters and activities and how we think this book could be used effectively within experiential learning programs, whether that be an internship, a cooperative education placement as I've described, a study abroad program, um, or any place or situation where students are integrating their academic and experiential learning. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I, um, I'm Jonathan Andrew. I'm the co-author of, of the book as well. Um, I also would like to add that the, the book itself is a culmination of our observations on the reflections from our students. So last year, we started the book by, by surveying our, our students, our uh, employer partners on our cooperative education program, um, and our academic faculty to, to gather insights about how they felt about experiential education and, and how experiential education can prepare students for the professional workplace, for their personal development, and for their academic success. Um, and the way the book is structured is uh, in a way that will provide depth on, on the concepts that we felt that through our advising session that students would benefit the most from. Um, in, you know, and the student challenges we hope to address in the book are related to the anxieties they feel um, or that they felt in their, their co-op search, the struggles that they have with their, their confidence at times, their, their ability to be patient, to be independent and self-directed, um, to be empathetic. Um, but we also wanted our students to cultivate a sense of purpose through their education. So the idea is that when students come into their uh, institutions of higher education that they could use this book as a way to think about ways of making the, the college experience a real experience for them, how, how the college itself can become the real world um, and not something that's kind of this, this theoretical place separated from the actual engagement with, with uh, communities of practice out in the field. Um, so this book is a collection of insights we have on the nature of students in and out of classroom experiences. Um, 
but we're also realizing the world is getting faster and more interconnected every day. Um, and that the value of this degree is, is starting to get questioned as it relates to the cost of higher education. So with students being saddled with tens of thousands of dollars of debt upon graduation, they're need, needing to be strategic in their education from the first day that they arrive. And this, is, um, this book is about giving students the tool to make the most of their time and cultivate their abilities um, and foster a sense of lifelong learning, a posture of learning that extends uh, beyond the university. So we're excited to share with you this, this overview of the book and the chapters and the activities that are in it. Um, and we'll provide you with some suggestions on how to use the book effectively with your experiential programs, um, no matter where they might be or the, the context that you're, you might be, be looking to use this text. Okay, so um, yeah, so just to to follow up a little bit on that, we'll we'll just review briefly kind of the foundational philosophy of the book and and some some concrete reasons that we see this book as a very timely and useful resource for students. So as John had just mentioned, you know, changes in the workplace and global society are really asking us as educators to prepare students for a workplace that's, that's globalized, that's rapidly changing, uh, that's interconnected, and one in which uh, will require students to be intentional about technology use in order to be fully engaged and active as persons, workers, and citizens. Um, the title of our book, Look Up, was, was actually prompted by seeing so many these days distracted from face-to-face -face interactions as, as they are looking down at their technological device of choice. And, and so the call for, for in the book is not to, to throw away the devices or to uh, minimize technology, but rather to help students be more conscious of the role that technology plays in their daily lives and the way that technology influences our styles of communication, our human relationships, and interactions and way of being in the world. So exper when, we, when we thought about that in connection with experiential learning, we feel that experiential learning really offers the opportunity for students to look up, to be curious, to be engaged, to be connected, um, to be observant, not only of our environments and, and counterparts, but also of, of themselves and their communities. So it provides a way for learning that is grounded in engagement, uh, direct practice, curiosity, and mindful integration of classroom and experiences in order for them to, to make meaning and to raise their awareness. So um, we also bring in, as the, the title denotes, um, personal, professional, and civic learning. So we feel that our experience working with students is that you know, it's a very holistic approach and one that these three kind of overlap naturally as students kind of come in and out of the classroom and workplaces and travel to different locations. So how can we help students to really be kind of to maximize that learning and to be aware of how um, they can take meaning from these experiences, uh, both in and out of the classroom. Um, so the way the book is um, structured is, is we wanted to have a real connection for students of where you can take kind of grounded concepts and theory about personal development, professional development, and then actually put them into practice through uh, interactive activities. So the book itself is is written in such a way that it's um, th that it's interactive. It provides students with with an ability to self direct through the book, or to work uh, hand in hand with an advisor or a, a teacher throughout. Um, so, so the idea is that students through reading this book are going to be able to own their own learning um, and periodically stop and reflect on, mm -hmm. on where they are in the process of, of, of an experience. So ideally this book is used in connection with some sort of formative experience. We've been using it in our 
classes here at Northeastern and um, a professional development class that students take before they go out on work experiences. Um, and we have some, some really good insights that we, we got back from our students around that as well. Um, the idea is, is for, for students is to kind of follow, follow up then with, with a mentor or an advisor um, to kind of check in on, on how they're processing things about the experience that they're having. Um, we also wanted students to have a professional development resource. Um, so there's a way, ways for um, students to engage both personally and, and professionally with, with the activities in the book. And at the very end of the book, we have a, a toolkit, which is broken into advising sessions, which are reflective prompts that encourage student deconstruction of their learning, case studies of, of things that students have, have run into, ethical dilemmas that they've run into in their professional lives or in their personal lives, classroom simulations. So if you're an instructor, you can use um, one of the simulations to um, try to enhance student learning through their experiences. Um, and then professional development resources like uh, resume, writing prompts, cover letters, um, all the things that, that students kind of want to be able to do by the time they're, they're looking to graduate and, and engage in a, a career or a job search. Um, so as we go through the outline um, in the, of the book and, and the chapters today, we, we also encourage you to kind of jot down any questions that you, you may have or, or points of interest and, and think about um, activities that, that you currently engage in and see if there's a utility for, for the concepts that we're, we're going through in the book today. Great, thanks, John. So, so we'll start with our first chapter, uh, which is fostering self awareness. And you can see here, um, each of the chapters we have a kind of a basic outline of the importance of, which kind of identifies the key areas, the impact of, how do you take these key concepts and learning and you know get, get traction and and uh, impact from these, and then the art of, which is really kind of consideration, considering the different ways that um, inquiry or reflection could be helpful or, um, you know, in this chapter we look at well-being, how students might balance that um, with, you know, their personal, professional, and, and civic development. So in this first chapter we begin by helping students first to understand the importance of self-awareness. Um, why is it important and how education can be used to help um, them cultivate a sense of purpose, both through their in and out of classroom experiences and how specifically experiential learning and this model can, can kind of set them in that direction. So we, in that, in that sense, we address concepts such as a student self image, uh, having a growth mindset, the work from uh, Carol Dweck on gro growth and fixed mindsets, the importance of self authorship um, in situ situational awareness. And from that, for that, we reference our, our, uh, our framework developed here at Northeastern. You can see it on the right side of your screen, um, which identifies key areas from which students to consider their, their uh, first to become aware and then to consider their development within each of these areas. And we use that as a platform for students to learn from these experiences both in and out of the classroom. And finally, as I mentioned, we conclude the chapter with a focus on self-care and wellness and, and having a sense of balance. We, we do that because, um, you know, probably like you all, we, we see that as a, as a real challenge for students in a fast-paced society and interconnected global world. Uh, how do they balance and, and um, and really make sure that they're they're getting uh, what they need and and um, you know can take take from these learning experiences so um, we emphasize the importance of taking care of yourself as a key part of, of your own learning and also to to help others in a kind of a civic sense I'd also like to add that over on the, the left hand side of the page here, you mm. see a, an illustration. So we we did reach out to um, our students to to help us with the construction of the book because we wanted the concepts to be relevant. So there's a number of narratives that that run through the book. Every section starts with either a student quote or a quote from an employer. Um, but we also encourage. Um, 
incorporate student artwork. And this is a student from Northeastern who uh, was an illustrator and, and helped us with uh, illustrations in different parts of the book. Again, the, the idea here is that we want this to be a, a resource that's relevant to students. And what we found by, by teaching this book in our course is that um, students relate really closely to the quotes that they, they see from other students mm -hmm. um, and you know, identify it, that as something that, that they would have said or they would have thought going through a, a similar sort of dilemma. So um, you'll see uh, you know, in this book, you'll see a number of different student narratives running through, which we hope makes it it relevant and, and connected to, to students when they're using it. Um, so our second chapter is about um, engaging in adaptive decision-making processes. And, and students uh, struggle with decision-making. We struggle with decision-making as you, know, you get older. So this is really is kind of a lifelong skill um, and, and a way for, uh, for us to kind of help students manage transitions between their, their different experiences. Um, so in this chapter, we focus on choices and decisions that students make throughout their college lives. Um, we talk about how do you get from here to there? How do you get to the place where you see yourself in the future? Or, or how do you start to project that? Um, and how do, you, uh, how do you use that kind of as your, your compass when, when navigating novel decision points? Um, and, but also looking at how does technology, the members of your direct and broader community influence your sense of choice um, and the decisions that you end up making. So we look at a number of different factors through the course of the, the chapter about health, wealth, career, personal growth, their interactions with people, um, and how those all can contribute to uh, a good or a uh, not so good decision making process depending on, on the type of uh, choice that they're making. Um, this kind of uh, resonated with me earlier this semester when I had a student um, who asked to meet with me because she expressed a fear of applying to any co-op jobs at all. Um, you know, she was worried about a number of things that she was feeling like she wasn't well qualified for the jobs that she was uh, applying to. She was dealing with a bit of imposter syndrome, um, that she was uh, feeling like she wasn't competitive with other, you know, students because they had more experience than her, which is a little bit of a a FOMO phenomenon, and she was worried about um, what to choose and, and was overwhelmed by the number of directions she could go and just a general fear that she could make the wrong choice for her first co-op job and thinking that it could somehow ruin the rest of her career. Um, so she had to be convinced to even take that first step to put herself out there and to have an experience from which to build other experiences from. And this is kind of an important um, inflection point for students, and it's a profile of student that we're encountering more and more who's constantly comparing themselves with others, being paralyzed by this, this sense of choice, and convinced that the best choice might be to make no choice at all. So this chapter is designed to help students better understand their choices and develop strategies and understand the emotions behind their gut reactions, when to know um, when intuition is pointing them in the right way, and, and how to better understand their uh, motivations, analyzes, analyze the the digital and personal forces that may be influencing their sense of control over decisions and develop strategies that will help them be more realistic about what steps are available to them. Additionally, we use the works of um, Nathan and Shafir to encourage students to look at how their routines are structured and places of scarcity that may be limiting their abilities to make clear-headed decisions. Um, and we also incorporate David Destano's work, um, Emotional Success, on using positive emotions like gratitude, compassion, and pride to enhance self-control and be more virtuous in our work and better equipped personally, professionally, and collaboratively. Um, so we culminate this chapter by encouraging a mindset that shows an affinity for change and fault tolerance and conclude with advice from Rothstein and Santana's work on make just one change on how to formulate effective questions that can help map decision points and brainstorms around hidden dimensions or our thought processes and priorities. Also, within the book, you'll see that it's broken into structures of um, the importance of, the impact of, and the art of. The importance of is kind of the theoretical concepts that we touch on with students. The impact of is, is things to um, influencing factors to think about and um, around the concepts. And the art of is actually practical advice or, or activities that students can do right now. Um, and here we talk also about the impact of, of using improvisational techniques with, with uh, other people to really brainstorm 
uh, what are realistic options for students when considering a cost benefit analysis. Okay. Great. All right. So moving on to chapter three, um, as John mentioned, we, we, we did, we piloted this, the book with our, in our intro to cooperative education course this semester. And this, this chapter in particular really um, resonated quite a bit with students. And even though we had been kind of doing uh, activities with them, like informational interviewing and other you know, shadowing people on jobs and, and different opportunities, somehow framing it within this, this intentional um, learning of, of really developing a mentoring community and how that, how that really impacts their learning helps students to engage a little bit more deeply. So in the chapter, we focus on, on kind of reviewing with students how to develop personal and professional relationships and why creating and belonging to a mentoring community is advantageous for their, for their growth and development. Um, and we, we actually looked at research in a particular study that was conducted at Hamilton College with about 100 students who were asked to, um, to speak about uh, what in their undergraduate years really mattered to them. Uh, what what was a, a, a like a core uh, a key learning or experience for them, and the core finding was that relationships shape the student experience. And one of the most um, valuable ones was was that of a mentor, a mentorship. So um, within the book, we cite within this chapter, we cite a story of one of our own students who who talked about a conference that she she attended and her own reserve or trepidation to approach the speaker, um, who, who she could kind of see of, as, as a potential mentor. However, um, after getting over that and actually reaching out and connecting, she ended up uh, working with him directly on a social impact project within her, own, um, within her own country, which led to creating a social enterprise program um, benefiting, you know, many of her, many people within her country. So, um, as John said, we try and use student examples, faculty and employer perspectives to highlight our, our, some of these concepts. So, also in this chapter, we use a faculty example of how um, this particular faculty developed professional relationships with students through a study abroad program that she led and this resulted in students actually getting jobs um, after graduation in these countries and them working as colleagues, um, you know, continuing uh, that they're learning and, and uh, collaboration. And lastly, we had an employer partner speak about how, how he had benefited from mentorship. And uh, I'll just read you a brief, uh, a brief piece of this quote. He said, I have benefited enormously from people who have encouraged young people myself. And he reflected, mentorship takes time. It's a one-on-one -on -one proposition. You need to take a strong and continuing interest in another person. So again, we demonstrate through these faculty, student, and employer narratives how being intentional in developing personal and professional relationships and looking for mentors and opportunities to mentor can provide impactful learning and growth for our students. Um, we also introduce students to, um, to how to conduct an informational interview, creating and maintaining a LinkedIn profile for networking and provide a job sh shadowing activity uh, for students to engage in. We encourage students in this chapter to seek out critical friends, um, as one employer partner uh, put it, or people who can provide you know, constructive feedback and advice. This is really, really helpful for students who are going into workplaces, going, traveling to new countries. How can they learn and get feedback on their, you know, what they're doing and how they might progress? And at the same time, we, we note our own students' acknowledgments on having gone on um, 
that believes in them and the impact that that can have on their learning and, and really on their confidence. So in the end, we, the, the chapter really seeks to encourage students to seek out new relationships and opportunities to learn collaboratively. So kind of continuing on this, chapter four, um, in this chapter we prompt students to, to better reflect on their sense of place and how that influences their understanding and sense of identity. And as we stated in the beginning of, of our talk today, you know, again, students are, are, are really uh, traveling and, and they're exposed to, to a lot of new environments. The college campus as kind of the ivory tower or, 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 or like even having a campus centric kind of position isn't, isn't that common anymore. It's really about student mobility and students getting out to, to, um, to diverse learning environments. So we, in the chapter, we outline and encourage students to view these transitions uh, from one culture to another. And that can be whether it's the classroom to the workplace or the home campus to a study abroad, um, to, to look at these as opportunities to, to develop and transfer skills and, and knowledge as they navigate these new environments. So we encourage our students to see workplaces and new cultures as catalysts, as ways to help them to understand how to make meaning of their experiences, whether that be shadowing somebody uh, listening to, uh, to a, a conversation or, or participating in a dialogue, collaborating with new, new, um, new people and new, uh, in new situations. And through this, developing trust, really, really finding ways to trust and engage with others. So we begin this chapter actually with a student reflection from her time in Cuba, uh, doing her co-op in Cuba and how she gained learning and perspective by being exposed to unfamiliar environments and circumstances. So in this anecdote, the student cited uh, attending a talk where she had the chance to meet a leading Cuban economist and how before he gave the talk, they had a, a, a chance to, to chat. And she wrote, uh, of all the things I could have talked to him about, uh, this person with great knowledge, one of her first questions to him was, how do I find eggs in Cuba? And he smiled, understanding this dilemma where, where you know, finding resources and, and making connections is not always so straightforward. So in, in talking with students and, and watching their learning, we've observed how, how navigating these diverse learning environments can lead to a sense of cultural humility and also a shared responsibility. So, Again, as the book's focus is experiential learning, we see that as really the key to our student success, helping them to see beyond previous assumptions, to think and experience, um, and become better understanding of other situations in the world. So this chapter uh, really aims to bring perspectives from our employer partners, as well as research that emphasizes the importance of students having the ability to transfer skills, to integrate their learning, and to develop soft skills. Um, the capacity to be flexible, adaptable, and transfer skills from one area or industry to another is key in the global workplace and society. And we hear that a lot actually from our employer partners who notice our students' abilities to do this. Um, and just I'll just close with another student anecdote who uh, described her perspective changing or shifting as she navigated through, through a number of diverse environments. She wrote, I've realized that if I can manage to do these things elsewhere, I can do them at home. I can be independent. It's forced me to be more prepared. It's forced me to question more to think more and be more reflective. And those are all things that we really want to encourage as part of our student learning um, and preparation for their um, going into the global workplace and society. 
Um, so for years, Joni and I have worked on helping students um, find co-op job placements in different places around the world. Um, and we've traveled to a number of international locations and we've sent hundreds of students abroad on, on work placements. Um, and they taught us a lot about what they learned uh, through, those experience, um, through those experiences. So um, in chapter five on boundaryless communication, um, Joni and I drew on these years of experience traveling, living abroad, um, and teaching our students on how to transition effectively in foreign and cross-cultural environments. The Dean Twang's work on iGen, um, which is the next generation coming into college in which um, she presented U.S. Sensa data um, research that demonstrated how those born between 1995 and 2012 are the most ethnically diverse generation in American history. Um, this generation also is one that will never know the world without the internet. Um, and some may have, may soon have not known the world without iPhones. Um, so this is a group that will be kind of experiencing a time that we're fundamentally changing how we communicate um, in an information rich world, um, where there are few boundaries limiting our communication with other people, um, and a much uh, bigger need for collaboration with people across cultural differences. So this um, acceleration um, in technology and our interconnected ability, um, it accelerates also the encounters with those unlike us um, and will require skills to quickly process, understand, and interpret meaning from others, from cultures and perspectives that are very different from our own. So in this chapter, we examine the discomfort that can arise from these experiences while also providing some techniques on how to communicate in a way that understands the source of that discomfort while also, also showing curious, curiosity, humility, empathy, understanding, and, and sometimes a sense of humor. Um, and these are the skills of cultural agility and, and sensitivity that are core to succeeding in a globalized and, and interconnected society. So the first step in understanding our own interpretive frameworks through which we encounter the world is, is to admit that we harbor these ethnocentric notions in which we assume others experience the world as we experience it. And it's something that actually some of my students in my class this semester expressed some fear about that there are places where people um, might misunderstand them or misinterpret them. So we encourage students to embrace Milton Bennett's platinum rule, which is the adaptation on, on the golden rule, the golden rule being to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Milton Bennett's platinum rule is instead to do unto others as they would have you do unto them, um, which is basically a call to embrace empathy in a true fashion and to really try to put yourself in the position of how you could understand how others may perceive us through their own eyes. Um, and to support this, we use the Jahari window, which you can see here, um, which if you're familiar with, is, is, is a heuristic device that was developed in the 1950s by Joseph Luft and Harrington Ingham for, for use in self-help groups and corporate consulting. Um, but the per Jahari window we're using here is developed by Claire Halverson and Akhil Termizi at the School for International Training in Vermont. Um, and it's used to encourage perspective shifting when working on multicultural teams. So the, these methods can help students be more self-aware, honest communicators with others in their work and learning environments. Um, additionally, we introduce concepts like high and low context cultures and cultural theories on how implicit and explicit meaning are used in intercultural communication. So we bring in some of the work of Edward Hall there. Um, there is an example also of one of our students from Ecuador returning, um, returning to um, Ecuador, which was her home country for a professional meeting um, and realizing that her professional experiences had all been in America, where it is impolite to, um, you know, where you usually get right down to business when you're coming into a meeting. But in Ecuador, um, there needs to be a, a time where you talk a little bit about yourself, about your family, um, in order to build trust um, through, through these personal conversations, um, which can be culturally taboo in American working environments that value more of, of efficiency, um, and direct communication. Um, so the idea here is to kind of expose students to different ways of thinking, different ways of professional practice, to think about how can they best um, work with people across uh, cultural divides. Um, to culminate the trap chapter, we, we introduced the concept of disconnection education um, to help students think about how do you get good at a myriad different communication technologies and devices. Um, the section is driven by our international employer partners' perceptions that students are not always good um, in their communication where, in environments where technology is limited. 
Um, so we encourage students to experience environments that they're, where they're required to turn off certain technologies, become adept at learning the nuances and communicating over the phone, by email, in person, verbally and non-verbally, via text and chat, social media, even letter writing, um, and, that, and that this will prepare them for the world of work in a number of contexts and places where technology is scarce and may create perceptual boundaries. Um, so really what we're trying to do is help students refine their digital presence as well um, to promote um, and, and uh, to promote in our students the ability to assume a posture of curiosity, gratitude, and respect when, when communicating in culturally appropriate ways. Um, the, the final chapter of the book um, is about developing agency for ethical and impactful professional and civic engagement. And this final chapter is basically our call to action and the invitation for students to bring all of the concepts of the book together. Um, here we discuss how to cultivate a sense of shared responsibilities to our communities locally and globally. And the chapter seeks to demonstrate how integrating in and out of classroom experiences can cultivate and drive a sense of purpose. Um, this is where we promote students to understand that the college classroom and campus is the real world and not something completely separate from it. Um, this chapter is also on how to actively and intentionally make the most of the college experience and foster a sense of self-direction and self-authorship. So we are hoping to provide students with the um, understanding and, and empowerment of, of how do you take that first step and how do you identify where you want that first step to be. Um, we also here incorporate the SAIL framework um, that Joni had mentioned earlier about fostering self-awareness. Here the SAIL framework is introduced as a way to look back on reflections of your experiences in order to ground yourself in the present understanding of your knowledge and skills and provide better ways to, uh, for students to reimagine their, their sense of the world, the value of the, the students' educations, and better articulate how the contributions that students hope to make to society in the future. So we use a number of student examples here on, on to demonstrate how students were able to see a change they hoped to make and took action on their way towards um, shorter long-term goals around the change that they would want to make in their community of practice. So for example, one of our students wrote a blog about her experiences of moving to Fargo, North Dakota after graduation on a whim. And she showed how her cumulative experiences taught her to be patient with herself, how to show appreciation to others and find ways to contribute to the common good through active engagement in her community. So we, we try to show it a way a sense of obligation to your communities and supporters um, and how that can work well alongside a sense of curiosity, innovation, and discovery um, by, by engaging with people and, and conversations and face-to-face -face activities. Um, so we highlight ways to develop agency and purpose while also being acutely aware of the impact the students have in their roles to, to their larger communities and society. And we bring in Paul Light's work on social change to utilize catalytic collaborators in those communities to, um, in order to improve the intended impact while also being mindful of how change can influence an entire social system. So um, the idea here is that social change requires authentic collaboration, requires active listening, empathy and sensitivity to, sensitivity to the lived experiences of others. Um, and we highlight here that there is a need to reflect on ethical considerations when taking action and how taking action can take many forms like civic action, voting with your dollars to push companies towards sustainable practices, amongst other things. Um, so in a time when we have access to more information than ever before, and we conclude with a push towards learning how to leverage that information to make more informed decisions that help to propel positive social change. And we encourage here for students to begin to articulate their own nar narratives and generate new ideas, reflect on old perspectives and be more aware and conscious of who they are, how they connect, um, and how they can look up and um, find what they can contribute to their shared communities as well. Great. Okay. So, um, so that that those are kind of a, a outline of each of the chapters. And as John had mentioned in the beginning of our our talk today, we also we conclude the book with what we call a toolkit, which consists of you know over sixty pages of activities and resources for uh, faculty you know, teaching courses, students to use independently, uh, program directors to use within their programs. And these are, were uh, gathered actually uh, th through our colleague Rebecca Westerling and ourselves who, who uh, worked with um, faculty from Northeastern to, to gain, to, to glean their uh, active, you know, their key activities and 
resources that they use in programs and classrooms um, that, that help students experiential learning. So um, as John mentioned, there's, there's activities students can use individually. Uh, there's, there's within the toolkit, there's takeoff um, templates for, you know, in classroom instruction or, you know, for students to do as out of classroom assignments. There's, as we, we talk a lot in the book about the, the role of reflection and how that is integral to students um, really deconstructing their learning. You know, we, we say you can have the experience but miss the meaning. And so these reflective prompts are meant for students to really uh, take the time to kind of break down what it is that they learned, how they would apply it, and how they might transfer this learning to, an, to a different environment or setting. And lastly, we have uh, case studies and other activities based on student or professional stories related to workplace, professional, uh, and civic and personal learning. Yeah, and um, we could use we could see this book being used in a number of different um, ways. Uh, Joni often talks about her vision of, of having students start their college career with this book, and then for every experiential activity, there's another way or perspective that this book can provide on, on how a student can can reflect on and, and interpret their experience as contributing to their overall personal development, but also their professional readiness once they, once they graduate. So we could see this as, as being very, uh, very connected with career and professional development advising, co-op advising, um, but also freshman year orientation, first year experience courses where students are being prompted to understand, you know, how do you integrate your in and out of classroom experiences? How do you take the, the holistic view of your of what you're learning and what your college experience can provide for you. Um, but then also any other experiential education advising or coursework, so study abroad preparation, uh, coursework on intercultural communication, uh, volunteer and service learning programs. Uh, we just were with North Central College in Illinois talking to them about how they can use uh, community engagement programming um, by using the book. Um, but also at the community college level where students are, are kind of processing where, what next steps they're doing. Maybe they're um, in trying to kind of manage a life transition. Um, these, this book could, could be really helpful there. And also there's a, there's a growing K through 12 experiential education uh, programming going on a, a, across the United States. And, and we see this as being a really good fit for, for those communities as well. Great, so we've been talking at you now for a while, and sorry, we, we just wanted to try and pull everything in as much as possible to give you a real sense of, of the book, the purpose, and, and, and the outline and, and, a, and a comprehensive overview. So we hope that the information was helpful, but we really would welcome um, any questions or comments or feedback, thoughts that, that you have um, from your perspective. Um, you know, wherever your, you know, whatever your context is. So, so thank you for your, for your participation today and your, your attention and, and we'd open it up at this point for, uh, for any questions. Thank you so much, Joni and Jonathan. Uh, keep those questions coming in. I have a, a few of them already here that I'd like to read if that's okay. Um, what's the feedback been from students uh, using this book? Yeah, so the feedback from, from our professional development classes has been largely uh, very good. Uh, the um, students uh, will usually pick out a few things that resonate with them. What we actually were doing this, this semester was kind of pulling out, um, you know, asking students to do reflective, uh, reflective questions, just kind of saying like what resonated with you for, with the book, what were some of the, you know, key takeaways from this chapter, what are some of the things that you're going to incorporate going forward into the, the co-op uh, work experience. And um, for the most part, what we've been seeing is, is that the, the student quotes that um, students have been reading really resonate with them. Some of the, the concepts of being overwhelmed by choice um, or uh, identifying um, 
mentors in, in your working environments were, were ones that students were, were like, wow, I never really thought of that, but I, I think that that's a really practical thing for me to consider when, when going into these experiences. So what we found with, our, with the delivery of our course is that this book brought a lot of the concepts together that we had been trying to impress upon students, um, but we were pulling information from books here and there. We didn't really, um, some of them resonated, some of them missed the mark. So we, we wanted to frame it in, in the sense of the student experience of, of what it's like to go through an experiential learning program. And what we're finding is that students are actually giving us more positive feedback on, on the relevance of the, the chapters to uh, what they're uh, preparing themselves for. Yeah, and um, yeah, I have. I, I actually could just pull a, a couple of basic, uh, we, we did, when we piloted the course, I mean the book in our course, we actually asked students for their uh, direct feedback. And I'll just give you an example. So for like a, a piece of feedback on chapter two from a student was, uh, this is on engaging in adaptive decision making. The student said, I will use this chapter a lot while on and after cooperative, my cooperative education placement because it really helps me to navigate my choices and reconsider the choices that I've made and reflect. Every decision is a potential point of learning, even decisions that you wish you had not made. Uh, the student points to the mind map as a useful activity um, for prioritizing and making decisions. And again, they say, I will ha have to make decisions using critical thinking. And uh, the book helps me to kind of um, utilize this as a tool. So uh, we, we really did get a, a lot of very positive feedback. And I think, as John said, we see this as kind of a one-stop shop. We really tried to gather a lot together into the book so that it was, it was you know, comprehensive for students. And then in addition to student feedback, we just presented at the uh, CEIA conference in Chicago to our colleagues there, and we got very positive feedback and their ideas for how they would use it within individual programs and contexts. And uh, we also have done presentations here at Northeastern, so our colleagues are, are, are also using the book and having you know, positive um, you know, experiences and success. So, so, so far, so good. We're, we're getting that, that positive feedback. Another thing I would add is that if you're looking to expand your international or global programs, mm. um, one of the things that students have been saying regularly with this is that this prompted them to think about doing something international or, or uh, uh, going on a global program. So um, it, does, yeah. it does help them to kind of get excited about, about the cross-cultural piece as well. Excellent. Uh, we do have a, a question from a Facebook Live viewer. Um, how would you suggest using this book with students outside of a classroom setting? Mm. Well, that's an interesting question because we're also piloting another, uh, we're, we're piloting with a, a faculty, academic faculty this summer, uh, who's bringing students on a short-term study abroad. And um, so he, we're, we're using the book in, in combination with the academic faculty to focus on the experiential learning aspects of the study abroad experience. So we've integrated several of the writing and reflective prompts into, um, into the curriculum that students will be uh, participating in over the summer. And we'll be gathering data on that. But certainly, as John said, as a, you know, Anybody who's leading a study abroad program or, um, you know, a student going on a study abroad, the book could be served as kind of a, a guide and a reference and pulling out pieces, um, you know, that are helpful for that. And then, as John said in the beginning, I, 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 my, my vision for the, the, um, the book, a, a big one would be just freshmen coming in to the intro to the college um, you know, experience and that what we do is we use that um, and this could be done through basically just introducing them to these key concepts of, you know, self-awareness, decision-making, communication, uh, belonging to a mentoring community. 
and really starting off um, kind of grounded in those concepts and then building them as they go through their, their college experience. Um, and as John said, there's a, a, a number of high schools that have come to us and that will be participating in this conference here at Northeastern in the summer uh, with K to 12 folks that are interested and using some, you know, the concepts and the, the kind of ideas from the book to help students uh, participate in experiential learning programs at the high school level. So those are a couple of examples, John. I would also add that um, the, the book itself was kind of designed to mirror what we saw our students go through as they prepared for their first professional experience. So. Mm. Um, a course could actually be designed around the, the, the progression of chapters. Um, so if you have a student who, if you're doing professional uh, preparation with students or you're just doing career development advising or, or something like this, you could start you know, with students of, of getting them to write a resume by being thinking about like their prior experiences and how to become more self-aware. And then when they're deciding which jobs to, to apply to, you could in, incorporate um, the, the chapter on decision making and being adaptive in your, your decision making processes. When students are trying for a networking device and trying to understand how to do informational interviews, you can use the mentorship chapter to support that. Um, when preparing students to actually go into the workplace, that's where you get into the navigating diverse learning environments and how to answer emails from employers with the boundaryless communication or, or how to, to uh, interview with someone who's in India or something like this, you know, that the, the boundaryless comes in there and then really cultivating a sense of purpose through the experience, through the, the agency chapter. And then it, all along the way, you have the toolkit that has a number of different things on, on resume development, on interviewing, on, on cover letter development, on, on self-awareness and, and um, these sorts of things. So um, you could really design something that, that hasn't even been, been built yet around that. Um, I know we're tied up against the clock here, but do you have time for one more question? Sure. Sure. Um, could you provide an example of an activity that you've done in your class that makes good use of the book? I know you've, you've done it throughout, but is there one that really resonates with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one that resonates with me is, is helping students um, mind map uh, their, their skills that they want to gain when, when developing learning outcomes for their experience. So um, what I did with students in, in my class is Kind of had them sit down with kind of a set of skills and, and think about how um, you know what skills do you have what are your skills gaps um, and then think about an experience where they knew that they had developed that skill or that they had worked on that skill and, and kind of starting with that kind of central experience as the center of the mind map and then kind of expanding um, on the skill areas from there connecting them to experiences think next experience where, where have I come from where do I want to go um, it kind of doing kind of an intentional storytelling exercise with students to to think about when they're going into an interview how do you tell someone about yourself in, in a way that's that's both highlighting the skills that you develop through your experiences but also identifying okay where are the weaknesses and strengths that I that I hope to um, work on when I'm working with you and, and fulfilling your needs as, as an employer. So really thinking about how do you structure good learning outcomes? What do you want to be able to do when you want to know more about through your, your next experience that you're having? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would echo, um, I think a lot, of, we, we in, in chapter one on fostering self-awareness, we, we bring in the, the, you know, one of the most commonly asked interview questions, tell me about yourself. And we actually go through an exercise um, helping students to prepare for an in interview. Um, and as John said, not just, you know, kind of, you know, like listing, a, a, you know, uh, their accomplishments, but really, you know, really talking about who they are, the, the questions that we, we kind of guide them with, are, you know, what have you done? What, what can you do? What do you want to do? And what needs to be done, you know, so so framing that within those different contexts in, in an authentic way that really speaks to why they're well suited for the position. 
Um, and then on the other hand, uh, another one that we, another activity that, um, that is really helpful is um, we, we walk students through strategies for developing cultural agility through a global experience. So uh, there's a whole activity in the toolkit that outlines, you know, how students can kind of find ways to develop cultural humility, uh, to be more agile, to, to bring this kind of um, global perspective to their learning and to their work and to their civic um, participation. So um, there, there, as we said, there are so many activities in the book and that's, that's one of the, actually that's one of the signature aspects we feel of the book is that it's not just about introducing concepts, but it's giving people concrete activities um, from which to work within their own program um, or course. So, we, so that's something we thought would be really helpful for people. That's great. Thank you so much, Joni and Jonathan. Really enjoyed our time today. Well, thank you, Ryan, for, for your coordination and setting this up and the moderation. And thank you also to the participants for taking the time today to, to, to come and listen. And, um, you know, we're happy to follow up with any additional questions or thoughts that you have about, um, you know, about the, the book. Uh, we'll just, you know, identify here that you, know, you can get a desk copy to review the book through Kendall Hunt, here's some, some information. And um, as you do that and uh, you have questions or comments, we'd, we'd welcome those. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I will send a recording of this out in, in the coming days as well. So once again, thank you for your time and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, you as well. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you.